just woke up. Luke chapter 16 is a very familiar passage of Scripture. I realize that, uh, and I'm not going to take time to read the entirety of the text because it is uh, familiar to you if you've been in church very long at all. The story that has occurred there or the event that has transpired. And uh, I want to draw your attention only to one statement or one verse. Luke 15, verse 17. You see so much truth there in uh, relation to humanity and the uh, father as well as the two boys. In verse 17, it says, And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's house, uh, our fathers, have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger. I don't know where you underline in your Bible or not, but if you do, uh, those words there, when he came to himself, I find very interesting, and I want to use that as the basis of my message to you this morning. Several years ago, I was uh, pastoring in Wyoming, and I uh, was also at that time pastoring two different churches. And uh, we were, it was uh, Monday, and we were beginning uh, vacation Bible school in one church that was 35 miles away from the church uh, in Sundance, Wyoming. And I wanted to do something different before the, mo the week got really into its full sway. I'd wanted to break, uh, there was one of, the, one of the men in our church had uh, several horses, lived on a little ranch, and I'd wanted to uh, break a horse for him uh, for some time, and I chose that morning as one that I would uh, get up early and go down to the ranch and uh, catch the horse and work with him a while and see if we couldn't break him. Now, I don't know where we have any cowboys here or not, uh, but uh, I... Uh, have always been a wannabe cowboy from a little a little bitty guy uh, until, I guess, while we were out west and had the opportunity to be. But anyway, I, uh, the horse had never had anything but an all halter put on it. And uh, so I had a long ways to go. I had a lot to do. It was early in the morning. Uh, I'd gotten down there before the owner had gotten up and uh, had gone out and caught the horse and had him in the corral and uh, used uh, all my horse whispering techniques I could come up with to get the bridle on and uh, uh, get the blanket on and get the saddle on, you know, trying to do it gracefully and do it uh, easy so as not to have all the trouble that you can have out of some unbroken horses. And uh, I was successful in doing all of that, and I finally got on the horse and uh, was able to stay on. Uh, and I got off, it was time, I, by that time it was uh, late in the morning and I needed to get back because we were having VBS at the other church early, something like 10 o'clock I believe was our schedule. And uh, as I was just about to begin to remove the saddle and the blanket and the bridle and so forth, the owner came out uh, of his house and came down by the corral and when he did, he began to talk to me, and I turned my attention away from the horse to him and began to speak with him over the corral. As I did so, something happened. I, as of yet, do not know what fully occurred, but all of a sudden, that horse went ballistic and lunged forward into me. And when he did, of course, he's much heavier than I was, and he sent me flying back into the fence and into the ground. And I was dazed, to say the least. The horse was bucking all around me. And uh, the gentleman, the member of my church, came over and said, Well, preacher, are, are, are you okay? You really hit that fence and the ground hard. And I said, Well, I was just lying there, you know, in the days. And I said, I said, I think so. And about that time, I lifted up my left arm, and this bone went that away, and this bone went that away. And I said to him, I believe I've got a problem here. And he said, yes, sir, I, I believe you do. Uh, and I said, just let me lie here for a few moments and kind of get my bearing. Then I'll decide what I need to do. And he went around to catch the horse. And 
to uh, take care, get him away from me primarily in his uh, uh, bucking, and uh, the danger was great. I was laying right on the edge of the fence uh, there. So he did that, and as I, I laid there a few moments, then I got up, uh, I went to my car and uh, drove uh, eight miles into town uh, and went into the little hospital there in that small place, and I sat down, and they, they were, uh, said, we can't do it right now, you have to wait. So I waited, and I waited, and I waited. You know how it is in the hospital sometime. And then uh, they came and got me and carried me back and x-rayed the arm, and they said, well, uh, it is broken. And I said, well, I knew that. I realize that, but it needs to be said. They said, we can't set it. You'll have to have some other help. But during the course of that time that I was seated there, it wasn't my arm that was bothering me. It was my back. And it got worse and worse and worse and worse. And I went over to then uh, got in the car and went some 30 miles over to Spearfish, South Dakota. And while I was there, uh, I, uh, when I got there, I walked inside, and the nurse said, uh, Sir, you look like you're really in pain. And I said, Ma'am, that's the understatement if I ever heard one. I really am. She said, Well, we'll get you back just as quickly as I can. And they took me on back, and eventually they hung the thumb, and they pulled the arm, and they put a, a brace around it, and uh, then they said, now we can x-ray your back, and they x-rayed the back and found out we'd compressed a couple of vertebras, you know. And it's a miracle that I have no pain today, but God is good, is he not? And everybody said, amen. God is good all the time, all the time God is good. Uh, but in the uh, course of my wife sharing what had occurred uh, with one of the men, other men in the church, uh, he said, well, he... She said, I, we don't know what happened. And he said, well, he just woke up. And she said, what? And the, the cowboy said, well, the horse just woke up. And as he said that, or, and my wife related to me what he had said, then I thought, well, the horse must have realized that something was going on, that something wasn't right, that, that needed to be changed, and out of fear and just out of response, uh, he did what he could to change what he saw was not, what he felt was not the best for him. And I just happened to, I just happened to be in the way of his changing it. In that verse, in chapter 17, it talks about this young man and when he came to himself. When I... When I thought about the statement of the cowboy, he just woke up. It reminded me of this statement of this young man. Now, you know the story that's there in Luke uh, 15, and I'm not going to read it as I said, but I want to relate it to you a little bit with a Western scene. Let's say it was a, a ranch, and there are uh, there's two boys raised on that ranch. The father is a loving father. He meets their every need. He gives them everything they want. He cares about them. And the boys are totally different in personality. One seems to be content to carry on what's going on on the ranch there. But the younger son keeps looking on the other side of the fence. When he looks, he sees grass that is greener than what it is on his side of the fence. Oftentimes we do that, do we not? We look at ourselves and we say, oh me, sad am I. Look at somebody else we say, they've got everything going for them. I'd love to be in the place where they are. I'd love to be experiencing what they're experiencing. We're all inclined to look for greener grass on the other side. But as we well know, no, seldom do we get on the other side very long. We find out the grass wasn't really as green over there as we thought it was. But this young man, uh, he wants to change, and he wants to experience the greener grass on the other side. So he asked the father, Father, give me the, give me the inheritance that's mine. Now, in those days, he would have gotten one-third. The older son would have gotten two-thirds. He got a third. So let's say he gets a million dollars. Uh, maybe the ranch is worth three million. He gets a million, uh, and he goes out and he spends the entire. He spends the next, oh, we'll say six months or a year or something like that, with a lot of friends around him, and he eats and drinks, and he is merry, and he is spending and spending and spending and having all that fun. And the grass seems to be oh so green over here, but his friends hang around as long as he's got what money. And when the money runs out, 
and the partying stops, then they fade away, and he gets into a, a very difficult situation. Here is a, a young fellow that is uh, wanting to live it up, and now he's at the lowest ebb ever. He just wakes up, the scripture says. He comes to himself. Now, I believe this passage can reveal to us somebody that is away from God, that, uh, that has never been saved. Some view it that way. Some view it as a person who is saved, knows the Father, but has drifted away. In some area of their life, they are not related uh, or they are not yielded to the Lord Jesus Christ. But whether it be uh, the fact that a person, it pictures a person that is unsaved, that knows not the Father, or whether it pictures one that is saved but is away from God, it is it telling us that there is a great need evident, whether it be salvation or whether it be obedience. Now look at two or three things there with me, if you will, please. First, he realizes his separation, verse 16. Then verse 17, verse 16 says, No man gave unto him. His father had always taken care of everything. His father had been bestowed upon him uh, every blessing. He had no need for anything, and now no man's given to him, where his father's been giving and giving and giving. Sure, I remind you of John chapter 3, verse, verse 16, where it says that the father, uh, God, loves us so much that he gave his son, I mean, he gave his son, that's the ultimate, but he has given to us and given to us in the past, and as far as we know, he continued to do so, but he gives and he gives, but this man has come to the place no longer is there someone there to give unto him. Verse 17 says, and how many hired servants of my father's house have plenty. He realizes he's separated, separated from his father. One of the biggest challenges we as preachers or as Christians have is to help somebody understand that they are separated from God and that they need the forgiveness that only God can give and that they need to be brought back into fellowship with God. They need to be reconciled to Him. It's one of the hardest things to get people lost. And if you don't get them lost, you're not going to get them saved. But the Bible makes it very clear that they are away from God. We're born that way, and we need to be born again into the family of God. The Scripture says, if you view it as a backslidden person, Scripture says the way of the transgressor is hard. How did he realize his separation from God? Notice two, two ways particularly. One was the circumstances that he created himself. And sometimes we get ourselves in such a, a mess, and that's what we, uh, God uses to bring us to the point of understanding or waking up to the need that's in our lives. He spent all, the Scripture says, he'd made blunder after blunder, and uh, certainly in given uh, away his his earnings or the inheritance. And then it, he began to be in want, the scripture says. May I say to you, the price tag of, uh, of refusing Jesus Christ is eternal hell. Separation from God. No higher price could be paid. The price to be paid for one who walks away from God is the lack of God's blessings and God's peace of heart. High price attached, didn't it? If that be true, there's a change needs to come in my life or yours. He realizes that he's at the very bottom. Verse 17 says, he says, I am perishing. Here he is uh, uh, at a point of great, great need like he's never known before in his life. I wonder what, sometimes what does God have to use to cause us to turn to him? Uh, whether we be uh, unsaved or wayward from the Lord, God knows how to speak to us. Sometimes it's broken health and uh, that God uses to, in some cases, men and women are flat of their back on the bed, maybe even toward the end of life, that God uses to bring them to the point that they are willing to consider God's changing things in their lives. Sometimes it's a broken marriage takes place before we wake up and realize what we have. Sometimes it's a dysfunctional home or rebellious children that 
God has to use to cause us to realize that and to awaken to the need of change in our lives. But there's also the circumstances that God creates. Verse 14 says that there was a mighty famine in the land. I mean, he had, had come to the point he could not find work, and finally he got a job feeding pigs, you know, swine. And for a Jewish boy, that was the worst thing. He was at the bottom of the barrel, to say the least. <laughs> a famine had come, and that was all he could find. God either brought these things on or he allowed them to come. And why did he do that? Because he loved this self-centered, rebellious, hard-hearted, foolish young man. No matter what is our condition of our heart, God loves us. And he wants to change anything that would take away from eternal, his eternal presence or from his blessings in this life. Because he has a plan for us. The scripture says it is not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants to save us. He wants to walk with us. And whatever it is that keeps that from occurring, God would have us to awaken to that reality. But then also, not only did he realize his separation, but he repented of his sinfulness. Verse 18, verse 21. Verse 18 says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Verse 21 says, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. My friend, this is not regret. This is repentance. Here's an indication from what his, his statements that he's really come to the place that he has awakened to his needs and he's willing to respond to those needs. Just like that horse when he realized something was going on and that needed to be changed, he responded as best he knew how. And of course, we're enlightened from the Word of God as to how we're to respond. He acknowledges his own sin against heaven, he says. And of course, sin's always against God first, as well as ourselves, the moral laws of God. And then he acknowledged not only his sin against God, but also humanity. Verse 18, he says, I have sinned before thee. Verse 19 and 21, no more worthy to be called thy son. Repentance means turning from, and he was willing to turn away from what he thought was the greener grass on the other side and come to the Father and make the changes that he desperately needed to make in his life. But notice also verse 19, he responded by surrender. His attitude in verse 19, verse 21, he says, I'm no more worthy. No more worthy. I yield to you is the attitude here. Matter of fact, his actions, verse 20 says, he arose and he, he came to his father. This young man woke up. You know, as we go into a new year, 2016, I have to ask myself, you have to ask, or I pray you'd ask yourself, what are the areas, what area in my life, I don't care what our age is, what area in my life, God, is there change, is needed, where change is needed? Am I to consider myself as a husband and look at my life afresh and anew and see if I've been the best husband I possibly could? Or can I change something in my life that may be minor, but yet it would be a great blessing to my wife? Otherwise, say there are the things in my life that I could alter, maybe an attitude, maybe a behavior, maybe a characteristic, whatever it may be, that might possibly be a tremendous blessing to my husband. Our parents say that about their children, the children say that about themselves. There's never in this life will we come to the place of perfection. So as we look at a new year, here's an opportunity for us to reevaluate, to assess whether we need to make changes or whether we and I'm sure, in reality, I know I do. And I guess maybe every one of us here would come to that conclusion as well. You know, some people wake up early in their lives. I'm glad that God spoke to my heart and I, was, I had enough understanding of the Word of God to know I need to put my faith in Christ when I was just a boy, when I was just seven years old, between seven and eight. I'm glad that the Lord 
spoke to my heart when I was 16 and said, you need to serve me. And he allowed me to do that and the privilege of being in the ministry all these years. And you, if God saved you early in life and all the things he's worked in your life to make of it all that you have been, I trust you made that decision early. That's why we have vacation Bible school. That's why we have Sunday school. That's why we have visitation and so forth to try to reach the children and even the young adults as well as and anyone else to try to help them see that they can wake up now. They don't need to wait to life as basically pass them by, wake up early. Thank God for the reality that we can wake up early. We don't have to waste our lives many a time. In this, uh, in the course of my ministry, I've had folk to say, Preacher, I just wish I'd been saved earlier. And I look back and I say, I wish you'd been saved earlier too. And sometimes they say, well, preacher, you know, I, I was in church and I was carrying out all the fundamentals that we expect to be carried out in the life of a, of a believer, but I didn't really have my faith and trust fixed in Jesus Christ. Huh. And they admit to the fact that they have played the role, but they have not really been prepared to die, and as a result, they've certainly not lived the life that they should have lived. They knew how, what was right, but it didn't come out in the li livelihood. Yeah, some people wake up early, and I praise the Lord for that. Some people wake up late, though. I remember uh, many, many occurrences, but uh, as I thought about this particular point, my mind raced to the thief. You know, that was hanging down on the cross beside Jesus when Jesus... Uh, was dying for you and me. And the thief that hung there, you know, he was just about at the end of his rope, wasn't he? I mean, you couldn't get much closer to death and awaken to the reality that you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. As he hung there, he said, Father, remember me. Remember me. Jesus said, today shalt thou be with me. He always responds. He always wants us to come to him. That's why we have the invitation. We come to Jesus for salvation. Come to Jesus. Let him forgive you and let him restore you. Uh, wherever whatever you may be, he can restore and make life meaningful. Thank God for that reality. Some people are late. The thief got to Jesus in time. I remember Sid Robinson, I heard him give his testimony uh, several years ago, and Sid Robinson was a stock car driver back in the 60s and well-known, won a lot of races. Uh, NASCAR was his uh, roaming ground, to say the least, and he was winning races and was eating, drinking, and partying most of the time. What time he went on the racetrack, he was partying. He had a wife and he had two little girls. When he would live that type of life, of course, they were very, very hurt, disappointed. Finally, his wife had all she could take, and she left Sid Robinson and uh, took the girls, and uh, he didn't know where they were, but he didn't really care because he just uh, ate, drink, and drove and had a big time. But Sid Robinson ended up. One night in Daytona Beach, Florida, outside of a bar with a screwdriver sticking all the way through his neck, left for dead. By the grace of God, somebody found him during the night, got him to a hospital in time. His life was spared, and while he was there in the hospital, he realized he had heard the gospel. He realized that his life was in desperate need of change, and there in the hospital, he was gloriously saved. Oh, hallelujah. Isn't God long-suffering and merciful to us? When he got out of the hospital, he wanted to find his wife and his two girls. And he began to search. Finally, he located them, and Sid said he went to the apartment where they were living at that time, and he knocked on the door. And the wife looked out the peephole, realized who it was. She wouldn't open the door. She went back in the other room. He kept on knocking, kept on knocking. And finally, she came back to the door, and she spoke, and she said, Sid, will you please go away? I've had all I can take. I don't want to live with you anymore. Leave us alone, please. 
said, Sal, I wept there, and I said, please, please give me another chance. Please let me in. I'm different. I've changed. Please call the pastor if you wish. And she said, in her own testimony, his wife said, I did, wasn't about to call the preacher. I'd called the pastor before, and as he came, Sid would make jokes about Christians and church and the preacher himself and pour alcohol all over him. And he said, she said, he had embarrassed me for the last time. I wasn't about to call the preacher. But Sid would not give in. Sid said, I've got to talk to you. And finally, she lets him in. He explains to her what has happened in his life. And uh, they are gloriously, make a story, a short story, even shorter. They were united again. And Sid said in his testimony, I can take you now and I'll show you where God has taken away the partying and has placed furniture in the home. I can take you and show you my family that at one time hated and feared to see me coming and now love me and want me to come. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Sid said, some people wake up late, but some people wake up too late, too late. Oh, everybody's going to wake up, there's no doubt about that, but the scripture talks about the fact that it's pointed on the man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. I mean, you know, at the judgment, a great white throne judgment, there's not going to be an opportunity for alteration. If we leave this life lost, then we're lost for all eternity. The scripture teaches us that that is a reality and instead of the glory of being present in the, uh, with the Father and with all of those that do know Christ as Savior, we are separated from them. There's no peace. There's no goodness. There's no pleasure of the Lord in that place called hell where we ultimately spend all of eternity. See, everybody exists, always exists from now on, from the time of birth. They are eternal beings. But the question is, where will they spend eternity? Everybody wakes up. One day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, the scripture says. It is very clear about that issue. As Havner said, that we desperately need to wake up because there's anarchy in the world. Boy, that's true, isn't it? I mean, we can say with, when the vulgarity of Howard Stern is chosen over, maybe the commentator, uh, Reggie, uh, is it Reggie White? Yes, that they fired because he mentioned the sin of, that's going on in many people's lives. When that kind of thing goes on, you bet there's anarchy in the world. He says there's apostasy in the church, no doubt about that. One survey was taken, and evangelicals, and 62% of evangelicals now said that there's no such thing as absolute truth. May I say to you, my friend, this is absolute truth, and we can accept the Word of God, or we can reject it. We have that choice. But if we reject it, we have no alternative. But if we accept it and understand the reality of what God's given us by revealing Himself to us in the Word of God, we have the absolute truth in the Bible which to base our, base our lives as well as all of eternity. Apathy, not only is there apostasy in the church, but there's apathy in the pew. Everything goes on and on and on, but nothing changes. We don't want to change. We don't want to find new solutions or try to be better in our Christian walk or in our practice of the work of the church. I believe the solution is found in Romans chapter 13. You want to turn over there with me real quickly, please? Romans chapter 13. It's one thing to spell out the problem, and when we, look, we can see that, we need to wake up. We need to make some changes in every dimension of our lives and experience. In Romans chapter 13, here is a, an interesting passage of Scripture as well, to say the least. He says... In verse 11, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time, notice what he says, to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. 
Jesus is coming back. Could it be in 2016? You say, I've heard that all my life. Yeah, but one of these days, God's going to fulfill it. Old Testament saints had heard of the coming of the Redeemer uh, throughout the Old Testament, and finally he comes, and that's exactly what will happen in the return of Jesus as a thief in the night, the Scripture says. Verse 12, the night is forspent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting or drunkenness, not in chambering and wantedness, not in strife and envying, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Very clear what needs to happen to us. That is, we need to wake up. That's, very, that's what he's saying here. We need to wake up in the pulpit. All too often uh, we are careless in what we do and how we uh, present the gospel and, and the ministry of the pulpit is so important. And I'll be honest with you, I allow the, the blame to fall back on the pulpit before it falls into the pew. For any church or for Christendom in America today, we failed as preachers, but ye, but ye brethren are not in darkness, the scripture says, that at that day should overtake you as a thief in the night. And the darker the hour, the greater the opportunity. We live in a dark hour, but listen to verse 11, and that knowing the time, that now is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. It's time to wake up. Do we need to wake, Do you need to wake up? Do I need to wake up some area in my life? It's time to clean up. I believe the scripture is very clear. Verse 12 there he says, Cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And the picture here is uh, that of a person that's been out on the town living it up. And you notice six things there he mentions. Uh, the rioting and the drunkenness, that's loose living, straighten that up, wake up to what that's doing to you, to your family, to uh, your, your testimony, your church. Look at, uh, he, then he mentions chambering, wantedness, he's talking about immorality and shamelessness there. And then in verse 13, it's time that we would realize the strife and the envy uh, that destroys power and causes uh, problems even amongst the brethren. All of these things he brings into focus here in that we need to clean up in these areas. But then notice lastly, he needs to, we need to dress up. Verse 12, put on the whole armor of light. Verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder this morning as we think about the need to awaken May God help us to allow God to put the searchlight. May he help us to put the searchlight, or he put the searchlight on our hearts to see where we could benefit ourselves, where we could benefit others, where we could glorify God in a greater way by awakening to the changes that need to be made in our lives, in our marriages, in our families, in our church, Wherever God may put his finger to wake up to that reality of need and make what change he points out and shows us we need to make. And if we'll allow him to make those changes in our lives, then we can, in 2016, we can have God's blessings unlike maybe we've ever had before on our personal lives and on our ministries. And after all, isn't that, isn't that what it's all about? Let's pray together. This is our message this morning. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. As we're about to pray, would you be bold enough to put a invisible circle about yourself 
and just say in all honesty before God. You don't have to share it with me. You don't have to share it with other folk. But just honesty before God. What all in this circle do I need to wake up to? Do I need to change in my life? as you quietly consider that factor. May our hearts be humble before the Lord. Heavenly Father.